keep that open. Um, we're going to be looking at it in quite some detail as we go through. Let's just pray before we do that. Uh, Father God, we thank you for your word. Um, we thank you that we are privileged to be able to read the words that Jesus said um, over 2,000 years ago and that they teach us still today. They have the power to do that. And we pray that you'd help us to approach um, your word here with open minds and open hearts that we might be taught in just the way you want us to be taught right now. Amen. Do keep it open, as I said, and, and keep it open if you've got it at home, because we'll be um, going through it bit by bit. Um, but just before we do, I've got something for you to consider. Um, I wonder how you would respond if you thought your home was being approached by an intruder. What's your instinctive response to uh, the approach of a threatening stranger? Um, here are three examples of that. Um, they, you might not fit quite any of these categories. You're probably glad, for example, that you're not a hagfish, um, which is the, uh, the one closest to me on this side of the screen here. Hagfishes, when they feel anxious and threatened, they emit slime um, from every pore on their body so that they can slip and get away. Uh, the, uh, the Texas horned lizard, this one's gross, uh, to deter intruders when it feels like it's being threatened, it squirts blood out of its own eye. Hmm which might be useful for, for cold callers, I suppose. Um, and on the end there, we have um, a, a species of termite from French Guiana that blows itself up when it's approached by intruders to protect the colony. Now, thankfully, I don't think our responses to the idea of an intruder approaching are quite so extreme, but maybe they're not quite, um, uh, not quite so far from that as we might sometimes think. And the scenario I want you to have in your mind this morning as we come to this passage is this, there is a stranger approaching your house and they're laying claim to everything that you have from the foundations uh, to the roof tiles to the ornaments on your mantelpiece. How do you respond? In last week's sermon, we got the context and, and Andy's reminded us again briefly just now. So Jesus has just performed this miracle that wasn't just a healing miracle. It, it, it was a healing miracle because a man who had not been able to walk for 38 years got up and walked and took his mat and left. Um, but it was a bit more than that that was going on because Jesus does this on the Sabbath day. Uh, and because he did it on the Sabbath day, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, went after him. They sought him out to have a go at him. Um, and we find him in the middle of this dialogue with them, and he doesn't, in this dialogue, kind of back down, dial the tension back down. In fact, he ratchets it up. If you look at verse 18, um, they know exactly what is at stake. Just look back slightly in, in the chapter. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And so in the minds of these religious leaders of the day, their Old Testament view of God's holiness um, the forefront of their minds is that he's so holy, so morally pure, um, that their whole religious system is built around controlling who can access him. It's very hard to access him in that direct sense. And, and here's this person, here's this person making claims to be equal with God, to be God himself on earth, walking amongst them, to be worthy of honor in the same way that God is worthy of honor. He comes across to them as a stranger approaching their house, laying claim to everything that they have, from the foundations, to the roof tiles, to the ornaments on their mantelpiece. How will they respond? Well, we see that in verse 18 as well. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him utter rejection of who Jesus is. They just won't accept that he is who he says he is. And instead of trusting him, they persecute him. They go after him. And, and they do this so often. You can read throughout the Gospels, with the Pharisees, their response is to question, to challenge him, to test him. They send out their best teams of questioners to try and trap him. It's, it's a position of instinctive rejection. And that's the context for the passage. That's the dialogue that we find ourselves in. Jesus is responding to that instinctive rejection on their part, but maybe also on our part. I don't know whether you believe in Jesus at all, or, or whether you're a Christian who believes in Jesus but finds yourself 
from time to time, like the rest of us in seasons where it's very tempting to reject him. And maybe in a thousand tiny ways, you do. Perhaps you feel really secure um, and confident and stable in your faith. In that case, perhaps this message is for you in particular. The Pharisees felt really, really confident too. And then this stranger approaches their house, laying claim to everything they have. And so they want to know who he is. And if we just um, have the first slide up, um, they're, they're looking at his identity. They're questioning who he is and it should come up in a moment. Not that one. If you go back about 50 slides. Um, they are looking at, I'll tell you, then it will come up, um, the weighty evidence for his identity. Jesus lays out before them, thank you, um, the weighty evidence for Jesus' identity. He lays it before them so they can be in no doubt. Um, now, I don't know how many times um, I have said this, and maybe as parents or people in position of authority, um, you've said as well, because I said so, is, is the, the answer, right? So, Dad, why can't I watch TV right now? Because I said so. Um, it's usually the answer that I give when I don't have any good reason at all, and I've said something, and I feel like I've got to stick to it, because I said so. Now, of all people, Jesus could use that line right now. He's, he's the God who had the authority to make stars shine in outer space. He could have said, because I said so. You're challenging me, but just accept me because of who I am, because I said so. But he doesn't do that. Amazing. Look at verse 31. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. So I'm going to do more than that for you. Now, and he gives three types um, of evidence, three ways of, of kind of convincing them um, that his claims to be God are just as he says they are. And so first of all, look, he points to um, a key public figure that they all knew well, John the Baptist. Have a look at verse 33. You have sent to John the Baptist, and he has testified to the truth. And Jesus picks up on this because he knows that they know that many people flocked to John's ministry and the, the Jewish leaders themselves sent people out to go and find out who he was. They knew there was something distinctive and special about John. So he's challenging the Jewish leaders here to deal with the fact that they clearly recognized something special about John. He says it, doesn't he? They chose for a time to enjoy his light and yet they seem to have dismissed John's crystal clear claim, which he says in um, 134, earlier in John, that Jesus is God's chosen one. And the Pharisees have, I don't know, forgotten that, ignored it. Okay, second, in his, in his laying out of his weighty evidence, Jesus says, I've got a weightier testimony than that, um, and that is my works. Uh, look down again, so the, the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. So which works are we thinking of? I guess we're thinking of um, the healing miracle he's just performed that prompted this argument. But you could go back to chapter 4 and look at um, the healing of the official son. You could go back to chapter 2 and look at the changing of water into wine. All miracles which showed his godlike power. And he's challenging them. He's saying to these leaders, you know that you've seen me do things that only God can do. So who am I? And finally then, in his laying out of this case, Jesus points to the testimony of God himself. Have a look at verse 37. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. So God's voice testifies to Jesus um, directly. Uh, Jesus' baptism, the voice, you are my son whom I love. But then also indirectly, so um, throughout all of scriptures, God's voice was there, pointing the way to Christ. And if you look just slightly further down in our passage, 45 to 47, that's partly what those references to Moses are doing. Have a look at them. They set their hopes on Moses, and Moses was writing about Jesus. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. And the religious leaders had poured over these scriptures, thousands of hours. They should have known the testimony of God himself through scripture, inside out. And can I just say here, if you are interested in this question, who is Jesus? Is he the one he says he is? Are his claims credible? 
then please explore it. It's, it's exploring this question is the thing that made me a Christian. Looking at the evidence for who Jesus is, is is a fantastic thing to pursue. And I encourage you to do it. There's so many books out there that can help you do it. There are um, classics like Mere Christianity, by C.S. Lewis. Um, Tim Keller's um, The Reason for God. Brilliant books which deal with these, um, these kind of questions. And can I add here as well, um, if... Um, if you don't feel like reading one of those, um, can I recommend books for young people? <laughs> so uh, my daughter came back from camp um, yesterday with uh, a children's version of The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Uh, I read a book with my son, um, Is Christianity Really True? from The Good Book Company. Really, really useful. If you don't want to read one of the big ones, read one of the small ones. Um, the number of Christian books I don't get all the way through. Um, if you're anything like me, that'll be, there's quite a few. But it's so worth exploring. But I think there's something else going on really in this passage. Jesus knows um, that the, those intellectual questions, the theological doubts, the challenges to his identity are very often about something deeper underneath. Because all of that weighty evidence for Jesus' identity gets rejected. And that, um, if we just put the next slide up, the weighty evidence for Jesus' identity is rejected. And that's really, I think, what this this dialogue is about. He's not really trying to convince them to believe in him. He's presenting them with the evidence, which is so compelling, to reveal that what's going on underneath is more important. There's a problem not with the way they understand who he is, but with their willingness to understand who he is. There's an, an underlying issue for them. If you look at verse 37 to 40, we'll work this through. And I'm going to do an annoying teacher thing because I'm a teacher and therefore slightly annoying. Um, And uh, I'm going to ask you to look out for a word. I think there is one word in this sequence which really encapsulates what their response to him is. One key word which defines the way they respond to him. So I'll read it through, see if you could spot it. Um, The father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I wonder if you found my key word. I told you I'm quite annoying. I'm not going to tell you just yet what it is. Keep thinking because it's so important to try and engage with the text in front of us and to think, what's the word here? Because Jesus is talking to the religious superheroes of the day, the superstars. It's like the, you know, if this is football, these are the top team Premier League players. They're the best of the best. And he's telling them in front of like a home crowd, they're religious fans. He's telling them that they have never seen God's form, never heard his voice. They don't know God. They don't have his word in them despite the fact that they've poured over that word for thousands of hours and probably know most of it off by heart, some of these guys. And he's saying that all of those efforts, really, they know nothing. It's all amounting to absolutely nothing. He is a stranger approaching their house, laying claim to everything they have. How can he do that with such confidence? How can he know this? How does he know these things about them? Look at the second half of verse 38. He can say they know nothing of God. Read it through. For you do not believe the one he sent. What's the for? For. It tells us that's how Jesus has worked it out. That's how he knows. He knows they know nothing of God. All the scriptures for, because as a result of the fact that they don't believe the one he sent. And then in verse 39 to 40, he makes it even clearer and takes it a little further. And this is where we find the key word, which I think defines the way they respond to him. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, and yet you refuse to come to me to have life. They refuse. As the stranger approaches their house, 
and they feel threatened, the defense mechanisms kicked in, and their intellectual and theological objections are like so many guard dogs of their hearts, defending them. As the stranger approaches, the guard dog's ears prick up, they sense a threatening intruder, they snarl, they race to the fence, and they bark their heads off to keep him away. You'll have seen signs on people's gates, like the one that came up briefly earlier. Um, you're out for a pleasant walk, and when you go past someone's house and you see this, I can make it to the fence in two seconds. Can you? Turns a, turns a nice, pleasant stroll in the countryside into something that feels like the start of a very cheap Norfolk-based horror film. Um, I wonder if this is another way of phrasing what we're talking about now. If you just move it on. Brain-based objections can make it to the fence in two seconds. That instinctive response. And Jesus lays out this compelling evidence for them so that he can reveal that their brain-based objection, their, their critique of who he is, aren't the real issue. It's their hearts that are the problem. They see the evidence... Everyone sees the evidence, but they refuse to believe. It's not that they can't, but that they won't. It's a rejection by the heart, not the mind. And if you just pop up the next part of that sentence, um, we'll see where we're at um, in the story. The weighty evidence for Jesus' identity is rejected not by the mind, but the heart. So let's try and find that in the text, shall we? Look at 41 to 44, where Jesus says, I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. And isn't there something quite chilling about that, um, that start of 42? I know you. They're religious superstars of their day, and they can't hide behind their thousands of hours of scripture study or their life of rule abiding, he knows them. He sees through it all. You do not have the love of God in your hearts, he says. So, so what do they love? What is in their hearts? And I think we can work that out from here too. So look at 41 and 42 again. I don't accept glory from human beings, but I know you. How do those, the two halves of that sentence go together? What does that but in there mean? Well, it means that the fact that they all, all they really care about is glory from human beings. What's in their hearts is not the love of God. It's getting praise from each other. That's what they're into. And maybe that's why in, in 43, Jesus says that if someone else comes in my name, sorry, in, in his own name, forgive me, if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. Why is that? Well, maybe um, some of the commentators I read suggest because those others who come along claiming to be God's Messiah, lined up better with what the Pharisees really wanted to happen, what the religious leaders of the day really desired, which was a, a political um, revolution against the Romans, and it matched their personal agenda better. So to maximize their glory, um, they're more likely to accept those kind of people coming along because it matches what they want, what their hearts are really after. Have a look at 44 again. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another but do not seek the glory that comes only, sorry, from the only God? That word since is really important in there. Jesus is saying that the one thing is a consequence of the other thing. This happens since that happens. So to say how can you believe since you accept glory from one another is the same as saying the fact that you accept glory from one another is the reason that you cannot believe. Your hearts are set on people, not God. And for that reason, the moment Jesus approaches, your guard dogs have raced to the fence and are barking their heads off. And let me suggest here that we deal with exactly the same thing every day. So when something our hearts are holding on to feels threatened, our minds are at the fence in two seconds, coming up with all the reasons why this thing isn't true or, or, or isn't, you know, we, we don't trust it, we don't believe it. And Jesus so often challenges the things our hearts are hanging on to, doesn't he? At university, 
uh, my church paired me up with an older Christian to read the Bible one to one with and to do some mentoring with me. And it was one of the best things um, that happened in my Christian growth at that time. And I remember arriving for one of our sessions just stuffed full of questions and doubts, um, intellectual questions about Christianity, stuff I was like, oh, but what about this? What about that? Came full of that stuff. And my mentor um, listened to me really patiently, heard me out. Um, and then he looked at me and just asked one question in return. He said, and what else is going on in your life right now? What else is happening for you right now? Um, and in that moment, I saw that all these objections just happened to be, just, just so happened to be arising at the time when there was this, this girl that I quite liked. Um, and she wasn't a Christian. And I knew that was a problem. Well, I liked her anyway. And all these questions just happened to come along. My guard dogs were at the fence in two seconds. Incidentally, as so often happens, um, what felt like an annoying Christian restriction on my freedom at the time turned out to be God's great blessing for me. Because shortly after, I meet Helen, and we get married, and today's our anniversary. Um, 14 years. So, And isn't that often the way? The stuff that we feel like God is saying, um, oh, he's being such a killjoy. He's saying no to this. Very often, that's God having something else prepared for us, which is so much a greater blessing. That's an aside, really. But let's go back and think. Dealing with brain-based objections, I want to emphasize this, is not in itself a, a bad thing. Intellectual questions, exploring doubts that we might have with um, you know, reading material and, and trusted Christian friends is a really great way to, to build confidence in our faith. The rational base, basis of our faith is so sound that doing that can be a really great way to grow. But let's also be really mindful um, of the occasions when our brain-based objections are actually masking a deeper problem. Not that our brains can't believe, but that our hearts won't. They don't want to. And like the religious leaders, we refuse to come to him for life because it feels like he's a stranger approaching our house, laying claims to everything we have, and our guard dogs race to the fence. Keep them away. If you hear your guard dogs barking, by all means, explore that stuff. Ask the questions and do the reading. It's really useful. But also, really importantly, I think, and this is what that mentor showed me, stop, think, and pray. What is my heart hanging on to right now which might be causing me to reject Jesus, to want to push him back? Praise and esteem from others, maybe, like the Pharisees here. My own agenda for life, the thing that I want, maybe something that I've got my heart set on with that I think will make me happy but isn't godly. See, the good thing about the guard dogs is they are warning us of something. It's just usually more about our hearts than our heads. And this really matters. So as we come um, to the last portion here, this really matters. If you just put our sentence up, um, the weighty evidence for Jesus' identity is rejected not by the mind, but the heart in the face of unstoppable judgment. Have a look at verse 45. But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. There will be an accusation, a, a judgment before the Father. And this reference to Moses here really touches a, a nerve for those religious leaders of the day. He was their spiritual father, their, you know, one of their heroes. Um, and Jesus here is saying that he to whom they've so looked up as a spiritual father and hero will himself accuse them. They, they read the stuff he wrote. Um, they've lived by it. And Moses himself will accuse them because... Moses was writing about Jesus, and they'd missed it. They'd never really believed what Jesus, sorry, what Moses had said. Never really understood it. Never really believed it. Because their hearts weren't looking for what it really meant. For us, as well as uh, for them, Moses gives this really amazing picture of who Jesus is, what he's like. Jesus is our savior from slavery to sin. He's our life-giving food. 
um, and life-giving water in the desert. He's the fulfiller of all the rules that we can't keep. In, in Old Testament terms, he, he was the fulfiller of the ceremonial law um, because by his death, he makes us clean. And he was the fulfiller of the moral law. Um, he stored up blessing for us, earned blessing for us with his righteous life. Jesus is everything they and we have been waiting for even if we don't recognize it as he approaches us because you see jesus he's not a stranger approaching the house imagine um the guard dog's response when they race to the fence as this stranger looms out from the mist only to realize that it's not a stranger at all it's the master of the house coming home and if you want to waste some time this afternoon, go onto YouTube and type in um, dogs meet owners after a long time. Um, and you will, you will see what I mean. You'll get the idea very quickly. Um, clip after clip of these massive, scary-looking dogs becoming as playful as puppies um, when they recognize their owner, they recognize the master coming home, and they're all over them like playful puppies, rejoicing that their owner's there. See, there is, a, there is a coming judgment that could terrify us, just as it terrified the religious leaders, except that it doesn't need to. If you look back um, at 24, verse 24, slightly before our passage, and we read this last week, um, if you were here, Jesus makes it so clear and so simple. Verse 24, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life that's all it is hear his word and believe him who sent me see our hearts might tempt us will tempt us throughout life to reject jesus to push him away but let's pray that god would help us see that rejection for what it is not as evidence that the Christian faith is not credible or that Jesus isn't who he said he is, but as evidence that our broken hearts need his saving love all the more. And if we simply hear his word and believe, then we will not be judged for our heart's brokenness. Not one bit. We'll have crossed over from death to life already as we welcome the master home. Let's pray.